Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to the first episode of Virtual MLB Baseball Injury uh, Conference. Uh, Nick and I at Conte Sports Performance Therapy first thought about doing this about two weeks ago as a way to provide educational content uh, to MLB uh, medical departments during the shutdown. We felt that Zoom might be a good conduit uh, for the baseball medical organizations with the help of Ron Porterfield, Brian, Brandon McDaniel, Jim Blum, Jeff Blum, and Gary Green, we all were able to mobilize this relatively quickly. I want to especially thank Nancy Patterson Flynn, former Major League Athletic Trainer for the Dodgers, for all her technical support and the hours that we put in for meetings to try to make this happen. So uh, Jeff is going to be talking on repair versus reconstruction, when, where, and why. Um, Jeff is a native of Schenectady, New York. Um, it is undergraduate at North Carolina State University uh, and uh, in chemical engineering. Uh, due to, uh, I guess, multiple injuries he suffered baseball, uh, decided to go into the medical field where it was safer. He went to Duke University School of Medicine in 1994. Uh, he did his residency at HSS in New York and um, uh, did his, uh, his fellowship under Dr. Andrews and Dr. Clancy at ASMI. Uh, he's a team physician at Troy University um, and multiple, multiple uh, high schools in the Birmingham area. Uh, he works with the Birmingham Bar Barons, a AAA White Sox affiliate. Uh, and last but not least, he is a consultant on the Atlanta Ballet. Uh, I think he just consults them. I don't think he's part of the group. Uh, he's married to Tracy with his children, Christopher and Caroline. Uh, enjoys golf, baseball, fishing, and playing guitar. Okay, so um, we'll bring him on. Um, he, he'll uh, he'll take it from here. Go ahead, Jeff. So I thank everybody for the opportunity to be here. We're going to discuss UCL repair and augmentation with the uh, internal brace and the overhead athlete. Um, as you can see, I'm a consultant for Arthrex, and I receive a small royalty on the products that they make to support this technique. So it's important to learn from history and make sure we don't redefine insanity by doing the same thing and expecting a different result. The first person to describe UCL repair was Norwood in 1981. He described uh, that two out of four people returned to play at the same or higher level. Um, and subsequent to that, Frank Job, with the article that was authored, lead authored by John Conway, was the landmark article that people know as Tommy John surgery. Tommy John was the first patient in 1974. Conway reported on his patients, but what gets lost historically is that um, only 56 of the 70 patients were reconstructions. People don't remember that 14 of those were repairs. Um, and if you look at the data, only two out of the seven repairs in the major league population got back to, uh, to normal, whereas um, 12 out of 16 or 75% got back with the reconstruction. Um, so on the basis of this, Dr. Job rightfully decided that, that repair was a bad idea and reconstruction became what we all know of it. So historically speaking, uh, also Dr. Andrews <clears throat> published with Fred Azar on his experience in 2000, in about 100 patients, and, and the, the repair patients did not fare well in his, in his study either. So now we have two studies by two giants in the industry, two, two of the fathers of, of sports medicine and two of the early adopters of UCL surgery with a 30% return rate with, with repair. So, you know, uh, on the basis of that, these were, these were panned as a bad idea. Keep in mind that, that both of these guys were and still are some of the best elbow surgeons that ever lived. And so it was right to pan it as a bad idea. And, and we really didn't hear much about repair until Buddy Savoy kind of changed things. Buddy published two articles in the mid 2000s, both of which went largely unnoticed. Uh, one was UCL repair in, in the female athlete. Um, and he had excellent results 16 and 17 returned to play at, at about three months. Um, and this was a mix of plication and anchors and drill holes and, and a mix of sports. Nobody really paid much attention to that. I, this was published in our trade journal, and, and people didn't really see too much of this. 
And he published again in 2008 on overhead athletes. Now, these are mostly college age and high school age throwers. So this is mostly baseball. And, and 93% had good national results and 58 out of 60 returned to the same or higher level at an average of six months. But again, this went largely unnoticed. And, and people didn't pay much attention to this, even though it was published in the trade journal. So on the basis of those studies, less than 200 cases overall reported for 2017, generally poor outcomes compared to UCL reconstruction until Buddy kind of changed the game. But again, that went largely unnoticed. There was a renewed interest with newer technology and more experience with the operation. And so the question became, are we redefining insanity and thinking that doing the same thing again is going to change anything? Well, from our institution, we published a large scale study in 2010 on over 1,200 patients over a 10 year period with all of these being reconstructions with an ulnar nerve transposition. And we found that the average return time was about 12 months and, and about 85% of them returned to play at the same or higher level with a low complication rate. So this became what, what we all see as the gold standard is UCL reconstruction. It already was, but this was a large scale study. There have been a lot of studies on different techniques, all of which are good all of which have excellent outcomes. And, and to me, I, I impart to people that you should do what works best in your own hands. I don't think there's an advantage of one over the other. I think you should do what works best in your own hands. So the docking technique, which is how I learned to do it by Dr. Alchek when I was a resident at HSS in the late 90s, and there are hybrid techniques. There are, there are all different kinds of techniques. What about revision? Revision UCL surgery is not a good operation. It was not good outcomes. And we all kind of know that that's not, a, that's not a great thing for somebody that's looking to come back and throw. There's not great healing potential. The return rates are as low as 30% in some studies with some loss of some saber metrics and, and, and just on-field metrics. Uh, this is a 2016 study that I think Stan published on 31 revision since 99 with an average return time of over, two, over a year and a half uh, going on two years. Only uh, two-thirds were able to get back for one game, but only about 40% could return for at least 10, and, uh, and really just not, not good outcomes. So this is not a good operation. So the question became, especially in younger athletes and people with less pathology, you know, these are typically end avulsions with good tissue that just happened to tear or partial thickness injuries. Is, is UCL reconstruction really necessary in this population? And so after doing nearly 2,000 of these over a 15-year period, with Dr. Andrews in our practice, we still only had one answer. And it didn't really matter what the pathology was. We had one answer, and it was reconstruction. And the question was, are we doing too much of an operation for some of the people we were seeing? Not all, but some. And could we do a little bit better? And also, could we do better with revision? Could we, could we improve that? And so this new construct, this internal brace, and this is a picture of the internal brace, which is really a construct. It's two plastic anchors with a fiber tape, a collagen-dipped fiber tape um, between them, uh, one uh, through the eyelets of both anchors, and then a super suture you see coming off on the right side. That, that's the construct. And this was developed by a guy named Gordon Mackay, who's a foot and ankle surgeon in Scotland. And a great guy, he popularized this in, in the ankle. And I thought, you know, we can, we can apply this to the elbow. We had been thinking something like this for a while, but it wasn't until, you know, Gordon really kind of developed this and, and tested it and did it in, in vivo in, in, in people in the ankle before we really felt comfortable doing it in the elbow. So obviously before I did this in a live human with a pulse, I wanted to check this out in the lab. So we did a, a cadaver study. We looked at 10 match pair cadavers and we, we tested their uh, opening and we found that the gap opening at time zero was a little bit better in the repair group. That was not the point of the study. The point of the study was not to say this is better, but I wanted to make sure it was at least as good as what we were doing every day with reconstruction before I did this in a human being uh, with a pulse. And, and I wasn't willing to do it until I knew that I could do at least as well as what we were already doing. I didn't want to take any chances on being worse. And you can see here, this is the, the blue is intact, the red is the pair, and the green is the procedure, with the left cluster being the reconstruction and the right cluster being the repair. And, and then we did a cyclic study. Chris Jones, one of our fellows a few, back, a few years back, did a, did a cyclical study looking at uh, 100 and 500 cycles. And the gap formation was less with the repair than the reconstruction. And again, the point was not to say it was better. The point was to say it was at least as good. And on the basis of these two studies, we felt that it was at least as good. Now, even though the study was published in 2017, we did these things well before we, we did this in a, in a human. This also gave us the ability to say, hey, we can push these people pretty early and rehab them quick. We, we can push the range of motion and feel good about it. So who is a repair candidate? 
Well, this is probably one of the more important parts of this. And if you look at the MRI, and the MRI is certainly part of this, but it's not the only part. And it's not even the most important part. But from a preoperative standpoint, if you look at these two MRIs, these are two people that we would have previously reconstructed. You can see the one on the left where the arrow points to the avulsion of the tissue off the sublime tubercle, but the ligament tissue itself is perfectly healthy looking. And then you see the one on the right where there's this projecting and thesophyte and all this gray tissue that used to be the UCL. Um, there's a spur there. This is an already arthritic elbow in, in an older thrower. There's no way you can repair this. That stuff's not going to be repairable, and you're going to have to take off that big bone spur. This person has a tissue deficiency. And so there's a very different feel. The person on the left does not have a tissue deficiency. The person on the right does. Same thing here. The one on the right, that person is going to have a huge tissue deficiency when you remove that big enthesophyte off, whereas the person on the left is not going to have that. So from a candidate standpoint, it makes sense that, that you know, the person on the right in that picture is, is going to be a candidate. So this is a short video uh, that, that describes the procedure. Make our same incision. We enter from the posterior side of the medial condyle. We don't do a muscle split, so to speak, in the mid portion of the flexor perninator mass. We elevate the flexor perninator mass off the ligament. So we're splitting it at the very posterior aspect of the muscle so as not to cut through it. And that exposes the UCL there. You can see we've got the whole UCL exposed from distal to proximal. And so then we're going to split the ligament from the apex of the sublime tubercle. We start there, and we're cutting towards the medial epicondyle. You can see we've got the ulnar nerve protected posteriorly. And so we're going to expose this. Now, this person has a distal tear, and I shouldn't be able to see all that bone. This is a large tear. This is that MRI that I showed you where you can see the whole thing was off. That's a large area of bone on the sublime tubercle. And so we're going to take our first anchor, we're going to drill our tunnel right there at the apex of the sublime tubercle. We're going to insert our anchor with our tape and our super suture attached to it. Down goes the anchor, the driver pushes it down, the, the eyelet down into the base of the hole, and then we advance the, uh, the corkscrew down, and that holds that eyelet down in there, thereby holding in the suture and the tape. And we're going to take the tape and the suture and separate them. We're going to use the suture to repair the ligament back. This is effectively what Buddy did, what Buddy Savoy did. Buddy has been such a great resource to me through this process. I talked to him at the very beginning about my idea, and he was doing great with just the repair, and I wanted to make sure we did at least as well as that. So this kind of mimics what Buddy did. He stuck an anchor there and repaired back the ligament. So if I just wanted to stop there, I, I would figure I would get the same results Buddy did. So we, we put this in. We repair the ligament back down. And uh, you can see we're being real careful to uh, protect the ulnar nerve back there because it's pretty close by. Um, and then we're going to sew that down. We're going to tie the ligament uh, tear back, thereby repairing it back to the uh, sublime tubercle. Then we're going to close up the split that we made. So we're going to put a couple of stitches uh, through the split that we made to repair it back side to side. And then we're going to work on the proximal anchor. So the second anchor, whether it's proximal or distal, in this case, it's the distal tear. So the first anchor goes in distal. If the tear was proximal, the first anchor would go in proximally. The second anchor is where the art part of this comes in. So now we have to drill our tunnel, and it's important to make sure that this tunnel is not on the distal tip of the, uh, of the medial epicondyle. The uh, ligament originates on the anterior face of the medial epicondyle. It does not originate on the distal tip. If we're on the distal tip, we're too posterior, and that really does not do well from a ligament function standpoint, from a graft function standpoint. So this is an oversized tap. We got a little bit more tape going down and back in the tunnel. So I purposefully, for the purpose of this video, made this a little short. So I'm going to insert it in here. And this is going to be too tight. When I go to flex the elbow, I can't flex the elbow. The tape is too tight. It's indenting the underlying tissue. I can't flex the elbow past 90 without the anchor wanting to pull out. So now I'm going to pull the anchor back out. So I pull on the suture to pull the anchor back out. And I'm going to lengthen this. And I'm going to redo it. Now, I can tell you that when I do this, in, in, you know, in, in not, not for video purposes, I usually start with about the second or third thread of the anchor over the entrance to the hole. And again, I want to make sure that I can completely flex and extend the elbow with no increased pressure on the underlying ligament. I don't feel any tension in the elbow as I'm trying to do that. I don't feel any resistance to flexion and extension. In the course of this, the one piece of advice that I think is so important in doing this procedure you can absolutely over constrain a joint with this thing. The, the rigidity of this construct is so great. It's such a strong piece of uh, tape. You do not want to over tighten it. Don't over constrain the ligament. So um, we make sure we don't um, stress yield the ligament. We don't over constrain it. 
Um, and so this is a video we're going to come back to in a minute. This was five months post-op from the alpha patient, and, and I'll tell you in a minute why that's an issue or why I had an issue with it. Um, so based on our, the success that Buddy showed and the basic science showing time zero success, our first patient, the one you just saw, um, that's Mark Johnson. He underwent UCL repair with internal brace on August 8, 2013. And, and through December 31, 2016, we had done a total of 128 of these. There have now been nearly 400 done at our facility in Andrews, and our Arthrex estimates over 2,500 have been done to date uh, around the country, around the United States, and it's rapidly gaining uh, support. We lost 17 to follow-up, so we had 87% follow-up. Um, there were 107 males, about 96%, and a mean age of 18 and a quarter. This was about the same as Buddy's data. They were all dominant arms, so these are mostly high school and college pitchers. And uh, most of these are baseball. You can see 81% of these were pitchers, and the vast majority were baseball. All of these are throwers, the softball, javelin, and football uh, throwers. Um, as you can see, about two-thirds of the uh, players of the, of the patients in this study were baseball, uh, high school baseball, rather, and another third, about a third of them were collegiate with a, with a small number of recreational, professional, middle school uh, players. So this fits the younger less injured uh, time frame, the less injured uh, uh, what we see in clinically. Um, to get to the results, I think it's important to know the norms. So before we start spouting numbers about scores and patient reported outcomes, it's important to know what they should look like. So Jamie Franz, who was one of our fellows a few years back, published a study when he was a resident on, on the KJOC norm. Um, so healthy Major League Baseball players that have never been hurt um, have an average uh, KJAC score of 97. Um, the healthy minor leaguer has an average score about the same, about 97. The average professional pitcher, whether they've been hurt or not, has an average score of 91. If they had a history, or those that have not been injured, the ones that had a history of an upper extremity injury had a score of about 86, 87. And those that had, had surgery had an average score of 75. So keep those in mind for a second as we go to our next slide. So with 87% follow-up at 12 months and the same at, at 24 months, all 111 attempted to return to play. We had 102 out of 111, or 92%, able to return to play at the same or higher level. The KJOC score for, for the patients after 12 months averaged 86 and 91 after 24 months. So to go back, 86 is the ones with the upper extremity injury. 75 was the ones that had surgery. We were 86 and 91. To get to 91, you have to get back to the professional pitchers that had never had uh, injury or surgery. So throwing athletes rated their elbows at nearly 96 at 12 months, and the time to return to full competition was uh, between six and seven months. About half of them had an ulnar nerve transposition. There was no difference in the outcomes with and without ulnar nerve transposition. P-value was too great. Initially, we were not transposing all of these, and I was making smaller incisions and not transposing them all like we did with the uh, with the standard reconstructions. I've gone more to transposing them because I think that leaving the nerve in place because of the approach that we use going posterior and elevating the muscle belly, I, I think in some patients we get some scarring around the nerve from the approach. And I've had to go back and do some ulnar nerve transpositions on patients that I did not at the time of surgery. So my way of looking at it is uh, I've, I've never uh, – we had a patient that I wished I had not transposed, but I've had a few that I wished I had. So uh, my anecdotal experience tells me I need to be transposing them. Um, and you may ask, well, why don't you just do the muscle splitting approach in the mid belly and you can avoid the nerve? Um, I've seen more nerve injuries from folks in, in cases that I've reviewed from the muscle split than from the posterior approach when you're actually handling the nerve. And like I said in the beginning, do what works best in your hands. This is the way I've approached this operation for 20 plus years. I think it would be wrong for me to change it at this point and think I could do better. Um, what about the tear characteristics, proximal versus distal? Uh, no difference, high p-value, 0.7. There were, point, uh, there were four tears that had both proximal and distal components, and, and their KJOC scores were similar, but there was not enough data to comparatively say these belonged in the comparison or, or to say that they specifically were uh, willing to be in there. Prox or partial versus complete, again, no difference. So no difference whether we transpose the nerve, no difference whether it was proximal or distal, no difference whether it was partial or complete. We had a few complications, but none major. I had to remove a retained subcuticular stitch. So the, in pulling the stitch out, they broke the stitch under the skin. The patient continued to have pain uh, from the stitch. We went and took the stitch out, 
Um, and he recovered and went back to full play. Uh, we had to remove heterotopic bone twice in the same athlete. And, and I'll come back to him in a minute. Um, and we had to perform an ulnar nerve transposition in, in two patients um, eight months after repair. Uh, both returned to play four months after transposition. And one, I had to do a revision transposition um, because he ruptured the swing around his nerve and his nerve went back to being unstable. Um, these people all returned to play, including the heterotopic bone one. I'm going to come back to him in a second. I had one high school pitcher who underwent UCL repair after his ninth grade season at age 15. He pitched his whole 10th, 11th, and 12th grade season and retore after uh, nine or 10 starts um, his senior year uh, um, after the, the team was in their 30th game. Uh, so it was really towards the end of the season. And um, he tore, retore it, but he retore the whole thing. Tore not just the ligament, but the, the internal brace as well. Interestingly, his original tear was distal. And his later tear was proximal with complete UCL and internal brace. There, he, he went on to college but was not going to play baseball. And he declined revision. And in his most recent follow-up, wasn't having any elbow problems. But he obviously wasn't throwing either. The player who developed heterotopic ossification underwent a second resection um, after completing a full college season post-repair. So we did the repair. He got HO. We resected the HO. He went back to play the whole season. We took out the HO again. He kept coming back with stiffness. We kept making more bone despite radiation treatment, um, and, and he just wasn't doing well. We're going to again come back to him in a second because he plays into another part of this later. Um, most patients achieve full range of motion um, by six to eight weeks. Um, we start plyometric exercises after six weeks when range of motion is full, and I know Kevin's going to go into this, and the throwing program after that. This is the second patient I ever did. She's a gymnast, and you can see she's got incisions on both sides of her elbow. Um, she had a lateral-sided injury that was uh, flipped up into the joint, so I had to operate on her. And uh, this was four months. Uh, this is actually six weeks post-op uh, when she had full range of motion on both sides. Um, we did the internal brace on the medial side. Um, interestingly, she went back to um, absolute normal gymnastics at the five-month point. So this is the alpha patient again. This is the video I showed you earlier. Um, this was... Uh, Injury was in June, um, so he rested for eight weeks. He had pain with throwing. He underwent his repair uh, on 8-8-2013. This video was taken on January 11, 2014. Uh, interestingly, I was not happy with this. When they sent me this video, I thought the therapists and trainers were trying to derail an idea that I thought was looking pretty good. And they said that they could not keep this kid from throwing. He felt so good he wanted to throw. It was his senior year. He made uh, 10 starts. He went nine and, uh, or I'm sorry, he went eight and one with a no decision and got a junior college deal, pitched uh, two years of junior college, and uh, he's now a fireman in his hometown um, and not having any elbow problems. A great guy, and he's been great about uh, participating in this stuff with me. He's done a couple interviews and things, and a super nice guy. But uh, Mark was the first one to take the plunge. So, from a limitation standpoint, these are obviously high school and collegiate athletes. The first major league pitcher was done by George Paletta in June of 16. That was Seth Maness. Um, he returned to competition in March of 17 in Major League Baseball in May, so 11 months post-op. Um, we've done a total of 10 professional baseball players that have either made it to or came from the Major League level since then. We've had a bunch of NCAA people, a lot of those. I would say you know, a good third of the people we're doing this on are probably in the, in the college level, and there's obviously no control group been a lot of gymnasts and cheerleaders from that same time frame. There have been a lot more now. Um, wrestlers who required surgery due to lateral sided injuries, tennis players, volleyball players, swimmers, um, others, uh, pole vaulter even. Um, there have been a bunch of these people that, that have been successful with this. Um, a recent revision that I did, this is uh, interesting. Um, let me go back here. Um, I have revised five prior UCL reconstructions using this technique. Um, four of the five had modified Job. One of the five had the docking technique, all towards medial epicondyle. I did use a larger anchor. Uh, the normal anchors are 3.5 millimeters. I used a larger anchor um, on the medial epicondyle for all the revisions. Three of them have returned. The other two are less than six months post-op. But uh, there's a lot of interest in this from a revision standpoint. This is one that's of uh, particular interest recently. This is a 39-year-old Major League Baseball player who previously underwent a reconstruction with Palmaris autograph using the modified Job technique in 2011. 
He pitched seven seasons at the Major League Baseball level, had the onset of symptoms last summer, and was unable to complete his season. Um, this, is, this is his MRI, and you can see, um, I imagine you can see my cursor there. If you can't, look at the far right two slides, two images, proximally at the medial condyle. You can see that the tissue mass, which is both his native ligament and his graft, are completely torn away from the medial condyle. His bone appears pretty normal aside from the previous surgery. There's no fracture. There's no significant edema in the bone. His distal attachment looks fine. But this is an obvious proximal detachment, which is where these things usually detach uh, in the repeat setting. So this is pictures from his uh, surgery that I did. I had to find his nerve, um, which took a little bit. It took me about 15, 20 minutes to get his nerve um, in, uh, unencased from the scar around it. Um, and you can see the middle side with this big hole when we split his ligament. He's just got this mass of, of tissue that's torn away from the bone. So we freshened up the bone and, and did a repair. I used uh, two sutures up there in addition to the tape. And the bottom and the far right slide is the uh, is the final image after the repair. Um, he's uh, getting ready to return. He signed a free agent deal and uh, is anticipating a full return uh, later this summer if we get back to baseball. So my thoughts are that as with other ligamentous injuries in the body, end avulsions of the UCL can be repaired back to bone, partial thickness tears can be augmented, and the addition of an ultra-strong biologic enhanced tape in modern anchor technology may, may provide for a, a better, better time for healing and, and getting back to it quicker. It's important to note it's not a ligament replacement. The tape is not going to hold up over time. It, it can never be the primary uh, restraint. This may be a better option for revision uh, UCL injuries and reconstruction with the large mass tissue, and we'll know more about that coming forward. But right now, I would say it looks a lot better than my experience with reconstruction. Revision UCL reconstruction is one of those operations I don't ever really feel that great about. I don't really know if the tape is structural or simply a scaffold for healing, but it is never the primary restraint to valgus stress. Need for ulnar nerve, um, transposition, post repair, it's not really a previous problem for reconstruction that we've transposed them all. And so I've gone back to really transposing most of them with the repair. People have asked my opinion about revising after having a repair with internal brace. So the person that had the HO that we had to resect twice, um, he, he plays uh, for a college on the Atlantic coast and uh, in, in the DC area, uh, Northern Virginia and DC area. Nice young man. He's a, he, now he's a senior actually. Um, he just was not doing well after second time resecting that bone, and he was not able to get back for that next season. So we were talking about revising him. He had already been to see Chris uh, before we did the repair, and I asked for another opinion. I, I suggested that he get another opinion because I wanted a new set of eyes on this. So I called Chris and asked if he would see him. Chris ended up doing the surgery, which I, which I thought was a good idea. Um, and Chris said it was a very easy revision because there was no bone loss. The, the anchors that are, that are the plastic anchors created no reaction in the bone. So he was able to drill his tunnels in an absolutely normal way. He said it was the easiest revision he ever did and, and that the internal brace and underlying ligament were intact. Um, he, the kid has since regained all of his motion. Uh, he did an irradiation treatment um, after the reconstruction. And he, has, uh, he was actually pitching earlier this season before the uh, season got shut down by the coronavirus. But uh, I, I don't have experience with this personally, and Chris is the only one that I know that has done one. But so far, that looks pretty good in terms of revising after that. So my thoughts are that I have cautious optimism in patients with partial, partial thickness injuries. I'm not likely to use this technique in those who have attritional ruptures or poor quality tissue. I have been pushed into a couple of these lately. People who have said, oh, I, I cannot go through a, a reconstruction. I have time for that. Do the repair. If it doesn't work, I'll accept it. I, I'm not expecting the same results in those patients. I, I've only done a couple of those. I don't enjoy that. I don't think it's necessarily a great idea. Hopefully they'll get to play their one season or whatever and get to where they want to be. But I, I just don't know that I feel good about that in terms of saying that it's a good idea for people. And so now we're moving into higher levels of sports and more outcomes. Um, how to help in a coronavirus crisis. If you happen to own a distilling company, or a part of one, you make hand sanitizer and it happens to smell like tequila or gin, which makes it even better. So uh, we're helping out and getting this to all the uh, healthcare workers we can. And I hope everybody stays safe and we get back to work very soon. Thank you all very much. So um, everybody pretty much knows Kevin is gonna talk on UCL repair rehab. 
some of the similarities and, and differences from the reconstruction. He's going to get into uh, obviously the rehab uh, aspects of this thing. Um, Kevin has worked uh, professional baseball for 29 years uh, with the Rays since the organization started. He's uh, has over uh, well over 30 years of uh, experience um, uh, in doing rehab. He's associate clinical director for Champion Sports Medicine uh, in Birmingham. He's the director of rehabilitative uh, research at the Sports Medicine Institute in Birmingham. Um, he's published just, I, I got to believe these numbers are low, uh, published over 170 journal articles, over 115 book chapters, and has lectured at uh, 900 professional and scientific meetings. Um, I was going to list his hobbies, but I don't think he has time. Um, he's on the review board of nine journals, has received numerous professional awards, probably not enough. Uh, he's edited nine textbooks. Ugh. So, uh, Kevin, you're up. Thank you. Uh, congratulations to Stan and Nancy Flynn for putting this on. Uh, it's uh, always a test of uh, will and uh, everything else to have technology. It's a lot easier to do a uh, live seminar, to say the least. But Stan, thanks so much for doing this, and Nancy as well. Uh, and thank you all for joining us uh, this evening especially uh, during these challenging times, as Dr. Dugas mentioned. So I hope you're all healthy and safe uh, in your situation. I hope things get back to normal as soon as possible. So uh, I'm in Birmingham, Alabama, as Stan mentioned. Uh, this is our facility to your left, and our biomechanics lab is right next door. And if you ever get the chance, obviously, pr please visit us. Uh, it's great to be on the panel. I can't wait to hear Brandon's talk. Uh, Dr. Dugas's talk was excellent, and hopefully I can augment some of this. Uh, for the trainers on the, uh, on the webinar, this Saturday, uh, I'm actually hosting another webinar um, on ACL rehab. Actually, it's advanced exercise. We did one last uh, Saturday, had about 1,000 viewers from all around the world, and we're doing it again, kind of an encore. Uh, so it's actually an NFL player who had an ACL reconstruction. It was about five months post-op, and it goes through all the exercises. So you can go to my um, Instagram to register. It's free of charge. The only downside is there's no CEUs involved, not at least yet, uh, unlike this evening. So what is it that I'd, I'd like to say this evening in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes? Well, one is uh, significant rehab differences between a UCL internal brace versus a reconstruction. And also the rehab is evolving. And one of the things uh, you know, Stan and I have talked about this quite a bit is instead of giving kind of a straightforward, at two weeks we do this and four weeks we do that is, kind of talk about some of the good and bad about both these procedures and some of the insights perhaps. Uh, one thing for sure is uh, the elbow is an unforgiving joint and the baseball trainer is on the call and the physicians certainly know that, that when an elbow gets stiff, it's a big problem. Uh, but we also worry about UCL re-injury and uh, Stan has done quite a bit of work in that particular area as far as revisions. Uh, this is one paper we published last year in the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy. Uh, it's basically describing the UCL internal brace rehabilitation program. Uh, it has our protocol on it, so you're more than welcome, obviously, to view that at your leisure. As uh, Stan Conti had noted in a couple articles, elbow injuries seem to be increasing, like everybody on this webinar realizes that. And he wrote a nice paper in American uh, Journal of Orthopedics in 2016 that basically showed that from about 2010 in particular, elbow injuries have taken off and shoulder injuries have have been on the decrease. Uh, and that's a trend that continues. Um, another paper that Stan did with uh, Dr. Camp was looking at uh, how many people have had UCL surgery at the major league level as well as the minor league level. And it was really an offshoot of a previous paper that was published a couple of years prior, but it showed major league pitchers as far as on the active roster, it stayed about the same, 25, 26%. Whereas in the minor leagues, it went up by about 4% which was alarming to Stan uh, and all of us for that matter, that it seems like, again, younger players are undergoing these UCL surgeries. This is a paper by uh, Chris Ahmad, who uh, I know everyone on this call is in Major League Baseball or professional baseball, I should say. Um, this paper is dealing with the masses. And in the state of New York over a 10 year period, there was almost a 200% increase in the number of UCL surgeries. So those of you that maybe moonlight in a clinic in the off season or maybe think about uh, clinic work later, you're certainly going to see these people. And as Dr. Ahmad pointed out, the average age was somewhere around 17 to 18 years of age. 
here at Andrews Sports Medicine over the last 15 years or so, we've seen a change in the number of high school and, and youth baseball players undergoing UCL surgery. Now it's up to around 50, 55 percent compared to professional. Uh, Dr. Dugas already mentioned this, that about 83, 84 percent made it back in our particular study. But realize, personally, I think we can get up to 90 percent with good control, especially with uh, you all on this webinar. Uh, when you have absolute control of your players, I think you can expect nine out of 10 will make it back. A uh, paper by Dr. Uh, uh, Romeo and Dr. Erickson, an excellent paper, looked at a lot of different uh, physicians, uh, UCL, and they had about 83% return as well. Um, and so I think the numbers are pretty consistent. This is a paper uh, published by Dr. Fleisick that looked at UCL reconstructions and does the pitching performance or mechanics change? And the answer is no compared to a cohort. That basically if you had a reconstruction you basically threw the same as somebody who did not. And this is Dr. Dugas's paper on the internal brace for 92%. So if we look at the literature, we got 83 to 92% success, which leaves, according to my math, around 8 to 17% failure, depending on the paper you look at. So we can't you know, just disregard that, put our head in the sand, so to speak, and ignore that 8 to 17%. So the question is, you know, why do they fail? And it was mentioned by Dr. Dugas, uh, Stan did a great paper, and he's actually published a couple of papers on this, on revisions. And obviously they don't do quite as well as the primary. So, so what's changed with my rehab, the cut to the chase, so to speak, after those, those at lit review? Well, one is I'm a little bit slower with throwers today than I was maybe five years ago. Um, slower with aggressive things, and probably the same speed with just traditional exercise. We're also a little bit slower with our throwing programs. Second is, what have I learned? Well, not all UCLs are the same, and you all know that. When one of your players goes in the OR, some of them have flexion contractures, some of them have limitations in flexion, some of them have shoulder pathologies and so forth. The other thing is, I tend not to push elbow flexion quite as quick as I used to, and we'll talk about this in a second. Uh, then last thing is the throwing programs. And I, I hope I have time at the end to say a few things about loading and some work that's being done across uh, professional baseball with deloading. So throwing uh, several weeks and then deloading for a week or two and then loading again. And I, I'm a big fan of that personally. Maybe we can talk about that in the panel. So what about time and surgery? Does an earlier return to play increase the risk of failure and a revision? And Dr. Erickson, again, published a nice paper on this in shoulder elbow surgery in 2017 that basically showed that time to return to play, primary or revision, had no significant difference. Same thing with the return the same level. So I'm not advocating an early return by no means, but just realize maybe a month or two may not matter, at least according to the masses. I personally think anecdotally and empirically my experience is it does matter. So we have to develop a good treatment plan, and, and everybody on this webinar realizes this, that there is more to elbow rehab than the elbow. I think if you look at these pictures of these two young ladies landing from a jump, they're actually two different girls, um, and you saw someone land like this, you certainly wouldn't return them back to volleyball or basketball or, or soccer. You would say, man, I need to work on their dynamic control, and in particular, their hip. But we see young people, and I know you're, you all are professional, but we see young people that throw like this. And it's not fair to just rehab their elbow. Their problem is the rest of their body. Nice paper out of the Curl and Joke Clinic looked at scapular dyskinesis and the association with hip weakness. And they showed with a simple front step down, there was a high correlation. That if you couldn't do a front step down, you probably had scapular dyskinesis. And the reason I bring this up is when I'm dealing with an athlete like this guy, UCL reconstruction, one of the things we do during the rehab is front step downs. We do lateral slides. We do a tremendous amount for the lateral hip. And the reason we do this is one for power and control, acceleration, but also mechanics. If that back leg drops, that hip drops, you'll push with your elbow. There are several papers that have looked at that. So your shoulder drops, your scapula tends to move a little bit more and you lead with your elbow. So we do a variety of exercises like lateral slides, which is one of the best exercises for glute med and lateral hip. 
So we do a tremendous amount of these lateral slides as well. Another exercise that we try to combine is using the entire body. So this represents one of the big changes for me in the last few years as far as baseball rehab is, I don't want a person laying on the table and doing exercises. Once you get past that initial phase of a couple weeks, I'm gonna have you planking, I'm gonna have you on the stability ball, I'm gonna have you bringing your entire body into the equation, not just doing an isolated movement like uh, external rotation and sideline, which actually shows to be the highest EMG activity, by the way. So we try to do slides like this with their band and resistance bands, where we're linking the lower extremity and upper extremity, working in concert, like you see with this quarterback. So that's one piece of TheraBand CLX that's on his legs, crisscross onto his wrist, and he's basically doing these lateral movements. And the reason he's doing these lateral movements is engage his hips and his core. And as I mentioned before, 10 years ago, you know, I focused more on the table and maybe some standing exercises. Now it's a week or two on the table and then you're on a stability ball, you're seated on a stability ball, prone on a stability ball, you're not on the table like you see in the background here. Here's a volleyball player with a shoulder problem, so I apologize for this, I just didn't have a baseball player, but this is one piece of TheraBand CLX that we crisscross. And again, if you're seeing other types of people, maybe in your community, you know, the trainer is always the person that the neighbor comes to your house, right? Oh, my daughter, you know, uh, has this shoulder problem and she plays volleyball. Would you take a look at her, right? We're all, we all see that in our neighborhood. And, and I appreciate uh, the neighbors trusting me, but if I had a volleyball player who comes in the clinic or in my, my basement to take a look at, these are one of the, the primary exercises I would do with her. And you can see she's struggling. That back leg, or the bottom leg, I should say, the EMG is the highest than even the top leg that's going into hip abduction. One of my favorite exercises, prone ball drops. Two pound balls. Most of the time we do this on a stability ball, but we would start on the table. So for endurance. BFR, I know a very controversial subject. Um, I don't do this with everyone. I do it with some baseball players. This is a baseball player doing some BFR. Uh, but I'm monitoring them, and maybe we can talk about it on the panel. I'm a big fan of BFR for the lower extremity after ACL. We use a ton of it. Almost every ACL BFR gets put on. Um, shoulders with pitchers or arms, I should say, I'm just a little bit more paranoid. Um, but I will do it under certain circumstances. Here's a couple exercises we started doing just recently. This is a piece of TheraBand where Paul, one of my trainers, is actually doing a two pound ball throw into the wall. Or we can do something like this, where he's got a piece of TheraBand, we're resisting ER with the TheraBand, it's light resist, it's not super hard, but I'm doing a rhythmic stabilization to end range. And all the throwers I've done this on, they've really said, man, I, I really like that exercise. I feel like I'm getting a lot out of that. Uh, the other thing I'll start to do that's probably a little bit of a change in the last couple of years, is monitoring the amount of work and force that they're throwing with. So I like the modus sleeves, and I hate to use a brand name, but that's the only one that we use that's available. So we use the modus sleeve, and when they do their throwing programs, we're monitoring it. Um, and we'll talk about this toward the end with the throwing program and how some literature has come about by uh, Mike Reinhold in particular, looking at forces at the elbow. What about weighted ball throwing? Well, I'm, I'm proud to say that actually uh, I was involved with one of the first papers ever written on plyometrics for baseball players back in 93. So a little toot toot, I guess. Sorry for that. But Vern Gambetta was a strength and conditioning coach um, with the Chicago White Sox at the time when I worked in Chicago. And we said back in, you know, 86 uh, is when we started this. Uh, uh, true confession time here, 86, that's a lot of years ago, Stan, is uh, we said baseball players should be athletes and they should do some plyometrics. And the players didn't like it. Uh, they didn't like it at all. But with Steve Odger's work and uh, Vern Gambetta, they were both with the White Sox at the time, uh, we talked these players into doing plyometrics. And then weighted ball programs came shortly thereafter. And you're all familiar with this. Um, these weighted ball, different types of throws, and obviously uh, there's good and bad to this. Again, I am a fan of this under supervision. I'm not a fan of it, of a kid doing this on their own and getting too carried away. There is good evidence to show that weighted ball programs properly administer 
can increase ball velocity. I think it's also good as far as loading the arm, loading the elbow, as long as proper mechanics and no fatigue is, uh, is, um, is occurring. Uh, and everybody's after velocity, right? That's the name of the game with these weighted balls. And I know Mike Reinhold is going to do uh, a presentation soon to you all in this symposium that Stan has put together. So I won't steal his thunder, but just say that Mike's study was excellent. And he showed that the weighted ball will actually increase velocity. But in these high school kids, there was a higher risk of injury. This is one thing I use a lot of, and, and maybe some of you do as well. I'd love to hear if you do. This is a one-pound ball. He's 20 feet away from the mini tramp. And before they ever started throwing for a couple weeks, he would just do some light tossing. 50% intensity. Just getting used to the mechanics, getting used to the ball. And a one pound ball I use never more than that is because I just want that little bit of overweight to slow them down. Long toss. Obviously there's some people that really like the long toss. Um, obviously he likes long tossing. And this is a controversial subject. Um, and it's controversial in so much as how far does a player go? Um, here in Birmingham, Dr. Andrews has always been an advocate of 120 feet. Uh, he thinks mechanics change dramatically after that. Others have said go a little bit further. We have some players that want to go to 300 feet. Um, just for your information, we did a study on this, Dr. Fleisig and our biomechanist and myself, we went to a nearby college and we had college pitchers throw as far as they can. And when they got out to max distance, there was an increased amount of force at their medial elbow and there was more external rotation. And we all know as external rotation increases and you get further and further back, the load on the UCL goes up. So that's something to consider. This is some work from Mike Reinhold and the MODIS people. We're looking at Again, peak valgus torque with throwing. Once you get out to about 120, you're good. But beyond that 120, it gradually continues to increase. And you end up at 300 feet at about 54, 53 Newton meters of force, which is a pretty significant amount of force. Uh, the other aspect that I would say that I think is important that's changed in the last few years for me is that we try to have a very much an objective criteria to return to throwing. And I know it's beyond the scope of this evening in a, in a 20 minute talk to get into that, but maybe one day we can. We do ball drops, we do throws into the wall, into the mini tramp, we have you plank, we have you do step downs, and we use objective data, at least we believe it's objective data in our hands, to, to have a criteria to return to throwing. So we look at all the other things as well, but we do a functional test, similar to what we would do with an ACL patient with a hop test or a, uh, or a Y balance test or a, uh, uh, a T run or something like that. So in the last uh, three minutes, let me just summarize some things here. Um, UCL reconstructions and, and, and internal braces. Let me just contrast things a little bit and then talk about a few exercises and we'll wrap this up. When comparison, the first week, they're the same. We put you in a brace. Uh, you're at 90 degrees for seven days. We start moving you on day eight. Uh, the internal brace group, it was mentioned by Dr. Dugas, much quicker as far as getting your range of motion back. At four to six weeks, uh, we generally get full motion back. It may be a little tight in the flexion, but that's very rare and hyperflexion isn't that important. Reconstructions, uh, if Dr. Andrews was on the call right now, he would say by six weeks, we want full range. I'm more of an eight week guy. If it takes a little longer than six weeks, I'm okay. Eight weeks, I think, is, is good, and I'll explain why in a minute. Thrower's 10 exercise, that's just your standard isotonics, lightweight, full can, lateral raises, all your prone exercises. Internal brace, three weeks. Reconstructions, four weeks. Plyometrics, internal brace, six weeks roughly. Reconstructions, 12 weeks to 14, kind of depending. Throwing, interval throwing program. Internal brace, Dr. Dugas likes to target that eight week mark. Sometimes I'll talk him into 10 weeks. Uh, reconstructions, six weeks, depends on the physician time of the year. I like 20 weeks to start at five months. And then return to play realizes a nebulous term. That just means that you're getting into 
not only mound throwing, but actually facing someone and maybe a simulated game, something like that. Uh, what Dr. Dugas has reported is six months for internal brace. And for us with our reconstructions, we said about nine and a half months, but most of the time it's closer to 12. So again, for us, we use a brace. Uh, we get you moving pretty fast. The range of motion progression is, is quick. Uh, it's a quick return to, to plyometrics and throwing. And very rarely does anyone have a real big problem per se. I do want to mention one or two things about reconstruction. I think I have about two minutes left, uh, one minute left. Um, so here are the phases and we can make this available to you. One of the things that I've tried to do is push the phases out a little bit more. So you may start your interval throwing at four or five months, but from there you start your gradual mound work at seven to nine months. And then from nine months to 12 months is this mound progression and return to play. I mentioned this hyperflexion. So this is a study, these are the last two slides, Dan. This is a study from the University of Michigan where they put strain gauges in cadavers in the anterior bundle, as well as the posterior bundle of or band of the UCL. And they found that pretty minimal strain on the UCL, even with hyperflexion. But here's a slide that I, I borrowed from George Paletta. He presented this at our baseball course, calling it the killer curve. And I person goes into this, I don't want to call it hyperflexion, I want to call it about 100 degrees, 115 degrees and more. Almost every one of my reconstructions complain of pain. And Dr. Paletta's point is, because of where it makes the turn, it's actually causing rubbing. And in his mind, may cause some problems to the graft. And I just wanted to bring this up just so you keep in the back of your mind when you're rehabbing these individuals. Maybe we don't need the push flexion. George says he's not pushing flexion past 90 degrees, 100 degrees for six weeks. I'm a little quicker than that, but it's just something to keep in the back of your mind. So, and the last thing I'll leave you with is this deloading program as far as interval throwing. Six weeks, maybe long toss. The seventh week, we bring you closer in. Some people don't even throw at all. Uh, depends on the trainer and the organization. So something to consider as well. So with that, I'm gonna stop there. Stan, thank you very much and uh, look forward to a panel discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thanks, Kevin. That was great. Um, move on here to uh, Brandon's talk. Um, so he's going to be talking about increase in movement variability, uh, which I think is a really uh, good topic. Uh, where uh, I think a lot of people are into more movement patterns than isolated exercise, um, and uh, how to how to get that resilient pitcher after Tommy John surgery. Um, Brandon has been in the field of strength and conditioning for over 15 years. Um, he's pr previously with Exos, uh, formerly Athletes Performance. He was a performance co co coach within the Department of Defense, working with um, Special Forces uh, and that type of thing. Uh, he did that for a while. He spent three years with the Pittsburgh Pirates uh, as a minor league strength coach. He's presently the director of uh, player performance for uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers for the past uh, nine years. Brandon's married his wife, uh, Andrea, uh, and three sons, and reside in beautiful Burbank, California. Thank you. I really appreciate the, uh, the time and everybody being able to hop on, Stan. Nancy, thanks for putting this together. Um, going last, it probably makes the most sense uh, because uh, we went from surgery to rehab to then strength and conditioning, but more importantly, for the last 45 minutes, I got to sit around and figure out uh, how I was going to change my presentation because uh, both of you guys, uh, Dr. Dugas and, and Kevin, you did an amazing job with this. So uh, I'm thinking about this from a perspective of a, as a strength coach that just lost one of their you know, highest performers, one of their, their highest pitchers, maybe a starting pitcher or a reliever on the team. And the conversations that I'm going to have with them, I'm going to have with our pitching coach, that I'm going to have with uh, our athletic trainers, our physical therapists, our front office, and how we kind of put all these things together. I think the world of strength and conditioning is much different than it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And, and a lot of times I think we're trying to protect ourselves, or excuse me, protect our athletes from themselves. Um, I think that movement variability 
uh, encompasses a lot of different things. I think it, it encompasses the types of movement patterns that we look at and the types of uh, movement patterns that we load. Uh, so I'm going to run through this and, and this a lot of this again. My presentations aren't as uh, as thorough as, as the previous two, but there are a lot of it's a lot of anecdotal stuff that, that I've used over the last 15 years that I feel really strongly about and look forward to uh, answering some questions afterwards. So, you know, the let me get some of this out of my way here. Um, I always look at it like this, things that we would have loved to dial in before an injury. Hindsight's always 2020. We always wish we could have made the pitcher leaner or, or stronger or have more mobility or done a slower ramp up with them in spring training. And so everything seems much clearer when we, when we look after an injury. Uh, but that's where I start. If we could start over with this athlete, I always ask myself three questions. What kind of mechanical changes uh, would we make with this athlete? And I think that more importantly, what, my, what kinds of mechanical changes would our pitching coaches or even the athletes themselves want to make? And could they make them if they wanted to? Uh, number two, what kind of movement competency? So kind of the qualitative side of this and capacity changes would we make? So that's where the s and uh, part comes in. And then lastly, like what kind of workload can our athlete handle on the field after the surgery? I think of this as like handing off a finished product to Mark Pryor right now. And that I feel really confident in the fact that this guy is built up from an SNC standpoint to move on to the next steps. Um, to look at the pitching and throwing mechanics, I think there's two things uh, to note here. Biomechanics is a huge uh, topic right now. Anybody that has Kinetrax or another motion capture system, see me, something like that, gets a lot of biomechanical jargon. And, and I think that efficient positions is really important. I think there's a lot that we can learn from those. Uh, a lot of times those don't necessarily tell us intent of the pitch or maybe what's been going on in the whole picture, but it's extremely important and extremely helpful information that we have. Uh, I, I tend to think more in kinematics and how did we get into these efficient uh, positions? So the, the sequence of events. Uh, and I just wanna know like generally speaking and, and then specifically speaking, can their body sequence properly to get into those positions? So to break it down at a, at a more basic level, I look at two, uh, two types of positions. Can they get into a position to create energy or store en energy? Uh, and then can they get out of that position or unwind uh, to be able to, to deliver the ball. So spend a lot of time looking at the hip, especially the back hip and the ability to be mobile and stable and, and to sit back and, and use a little bit more glute, hamstring, posterior chain than the guy that likes to uh, dive forward, knee, knee in front of the toe and doesn't load the hip and then gets a lot of like anterior stress on the shoulder because they can't load their scap correctly. So like there's a lot of things to dive into. There's a lot of information. These are the two places that I usually start with a pitching coach or a pitcher. And then unloading, so like releasing the energy. Uh, for me, it's, it's the ability to create or time up the hip and torso separation to set the pelvis for front foot contact. So can we unwind the body to then hopefully properly deploy the unwinding of the throwing arm? Because I think that's a, where a lot of this stress uh, comes into place and we see a lot of front side mechanics where guys are trying to generate with their front side they get very chesty uh, you see their letters really early you see their torso really early and they get that late external rotation which which we know puts a ton of stress on the UCL um, and so these are these are kind of the uh, important parts that I just look at from a throwing standpoint just to just to touch on and then I'm going to dive in uh, looking past like past screens and things that we've looked at maybe in screen training or previous years. I'm going to look at a movement screen plus an athleticism screen plus the baseball mechanic side of it. Uh, so we're looking at movement competency. So these are more of your qualitative assessments. I think of the measurement of how. I think single joint assessments, uh, they tell us a ton about arthrokinematics and how well each joint moves individually. And I rely heavily uh, on Ron and Neil, our, our training staff, to, to get a lot of information because they do an unbelievable job of, of taking those measurements on our guys all the time. But just understanding how uh, the glenohumeral humeral joint moves or, or how the femur plays on the pelvis or the pelvis plays on the femur is extremely important in telling the story. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm gonna train there a lot, but I like to know uh, kind of the arthro side of that. And then the multi-joint screens, I think of our FMSs or whatever movement screen that you can. It's a little bit more osteokinematics. It's a little bit more of how the bones move, which is a little bit closer to maybe what we're dealing with on the field or in, in more of a, a global movement pattern. 
uh, harder to identify and definitely more qualitative, but still very important. Important, and this will help me kind of identify what exercises uh, that we're going to we're going to use in the weight room too. And then there's the baseball specific side, which is you know like a an on base U or or some type of some type of movement screen that puts them in uh, baseball or specifically pitching movements. So I want to see can the can the hip separate from the torso. Uh, how well can we get layback? How well can we get pronation? How well can we get supination? Because these are the these are ultimately going to be things that show up on the field. And then I look at it from a, a movement capacity standpoint. Now, so this is this is pure S and C, and so this is more of the measurement of how much. So we're going to measure force. We're going to measure rate of force. We're obviously going to measure velocity, and we're going to measure sequencing. So if that's force plates that you're using, if that's strength testing, whether it's a a, um, some type of uh, Kaiser or bar sensor that tells you, you know, the velocity of that, or we're using a K-Vest just to understand how somebody's sequencing, whether they're throwing a med ball, a plyo ball, or, or throwing a baseball. Uh, and then this has probably been my kick for the last four or five years, but uh, reverse engineering this from the field, like how do our players move on the field and what qualities are they missing on the field? Uh, that's really important to me when, when we're trying to drive these training programs and, and especially coming up with, you know, for an athlete that maybe failed on the field and had to have some type of surgery or potentially was shut down with some type of injury. I want to make sure that, that we go back and understand why that happened. And, and I don't think that's always because of something that we neglected in the weight room or the training room. Um, I then look at trainable positions. And so there's obviously a ton of trainable positions, but I, I'm thinking about this more from a principal standpoint, uh, more from a global standpoint, and, I, and I'm, and I'm going to look at like unilateral push, push positions because I think that that's uh, extremely important for baseball, whether it's a pitcher or a hitter. And so I want to know how well they lunge and when they lunge or when they RFE or, or whatever it might be, I want to know uh, what the other side of that is doing as well. And so if they get great flex, knee flexion and hip flexion to get into a position, I want to know where they get in good extension on the other side of that as well. Um, and I, it, as we get a better movement quality or competency in the sagittal plane, we're gonna start to introduce more planes of motion into this, but I really wanna see like flexion and extension, anterior, posterior, tilt of the pelvis and, and how those things work. Unilateral hip hinge position, so like a single leg RDL. I wanna, I wanna teach the pelvis to play nice with the femur. Like this sport, is very much dictated by our ability to move our pelvis around around our femurs. And if those things don't play nice, like I think there's a lot that happens, like going back and just looking at some of Kevin's presentation of, of jumping off of a box uh, leading to a little bit of uh, scap issues. Like I totally agree with that and think that our ability to create probably starts with this hinge position and our ability to front side block uh, up against something has something to do with this position as well. Uh, we look at, at upper body pull movements in, in both a vertical and, and a horizontal uh, type movement pattern. So you think of your lat pull downs or, or your, your uh, pull ups or, or whatever it might be. Really what we want to do is teach the scaps uh, to get it into the proper positions with hap with, without having to re you know, require the neck, the cervical or, or the lumbar spine to do with a lot of the movements. So we really try to teach guys to drive from their scaps to get depression, to get retraction uh, in, in, in the right pattern and, and at the right time. And then vice versa on upper body vertical horizontal uh, pushes, we're, we're teaching the same things. The scaps drive these, these movements. I think if you would walk into our weight room, you would notice that we don't spend a whole lot of time uh, doing elbow specific stuff, especially in rehabs, like there are much better people on the other side of the house to do that and spend a ton of time. We don't spend a lot of time with shoulder range of motion either, because again, Ron and his staff are, are unbelievable with that. And, and we're not going to dive into that. We're going to, we're going to go a little bit more global, a little bit big picture with this. And I firmly believe that if you train the scaps and if you get good stability and good thoracic, uh, mobility, that the shoulder and the elbow are going to end up taking care of themselves with the work that they're doing. When we've mastered the sagittal plane, we're gonna get into some, some pelvic rotation and we start very isolated with this. Uh, and then we integrate it back into bigger movements. And we usually start with assisted movements, teaching guys how to move, whether it be with sticks or bands or with manual resistance or assistance. And then we move into the resistance and, and get a little bit more of the constraint led uh, 
drills that, that we've we've messed around with a lot that we've got from the Florida baseball ranch or Franz Bosch or, or whoever it might be. And the same thing with thoracic rotation. I feel like we've, we'll hammer out extension and flexion of the thoracic spine with a lot of our upper body uh, pushing exercises and pulling exercises. But as we started to get into rotation and again, taking stress off of the shoulder, taking stress off of the lumbar spine, thoracic rotation becomes extremely important to us. And then we put it all together. And, and, and it's not just thoracic rotation and pelvic rotation, but it's our ability to kind of create force in the sagittal plane and then transfer it with our sequencing stuff. So that's med ball drills. We do a lot of plyo ball drills. We do a lot of constraint led drills with our guys uh, to learn how to sequence, especially when they're coming back. Cause, cause I just look at this as a way, an opportunity to take stress off of the, on the collateral ligament or wherever the injured site is uh and and to be able to put it into some exercises that will train us neurologically to understand how our body is supposed to store energy and then release it um for those of you that maybe saw the world pitching congress uh presentation that i that I did this off season back in january in st louis uh, these were kind of the five things that i broke down and they're very similar to the five things that i believe when we train athletes in general um, I don't care where you fall, and I'll get into a little bit of the, the density side of this in a second, but uh, I want to know, can you get into position? So I think of this as mobility and stability training. These are a lot of regressed movements, single joint movements. We're trying to lay down new neurological firing patterns, and we're trying to create new local, uh, new local tissue tolerance. And so, uh, you know, I really want to know, again, how well we can just move in those single joints. And we spend a lot of time on our hands and knees. We spend a lot of time, uh, you know, with very regressed movement patterns, because I think ultimately this is the most important part. This is also something that's getting handed out, I know, and with our PTs and our ATCs. Uh, and so we kind of team up on this as well to make sure that we're not laying down too much. But getting down into strength and power means nothing if we have no motor control. And so this is extremely important. This is stuff that we can start fairly quickly after you know we've been cleared by a doctor and an athletic trainer to, to move forward with a little bit of their rehab. Um, the second is, can you get into the positions and show endurance? Like, I guess this is probably what everybody defines as strength endurance. I, I do a lot of self-limiting exercises for this one. Again, we don't have a ton of weight, uh, but can we hold these positions isometrically? So we'll do a lot of timed holds at the bottom of an RFE, at the bottom of a single leg RDL, at the bottom of a of a push up or uh, a pull, whatever it might be. And then I wanna know, can you get in and out of these positions a lot, uh, high rep schemes, but not with a lot of force production. So it's just, I'm thinking of fitness generally here when we speak. And after we get through that and, and we feel very comfortable, and I think that this is all over the map for, for everybody, depending on what their training age is and some of the qualities I'm gonna get into in the next slide, uh, we're gonna get into true strength training. We're gonna get into the max strength part. And I think this is a huge uh, portion of coming back from an elbow injury. And this is the part where it gets dangerous. Um, if, our, if our athletes don't have one and two down and we just throw them right into a max strength program, we're just laying down more cement on bad fundamental movement patterns that are going to show back up on the mound. And so this is where I think that we can start to make some gains and, and start to get some easy uh, movement patterns, some free movement patterns with this max strength and not making it this thing that we need to grind out all the time. And, and as that moves on and we feel confident in our competency in this area, we're going to move into a force production, uh, a power phase, which is more of your traditional plyometric or speed strength training exercises that we do. So we do a lot of Kaiser exercises. We do a lot of vest stuff. We do a lot of plyos. We do get into uh, a lot of med ball throwing and a lot of plyo ball throwing here. And again, there are a lot of constraint led drills going all the way back to stuff that we have seen up on the field. And then lastly, like this is the CrossFit guy in me. Uh, I really believe in work capacity. I believe that you have to be able to show all of these qualities with stress, which is the way I would kind of define a CrossFit workout. It doesn't mean that we're going to do a bunch of kipping pull-ups or a bunch of cleans and jerks and things like that. But the stuff that Greg Glassman taught us about uh, work capacity and being able to perform things over a given time is extremely important. And I always tell our guys in the off season, the work capacity phase is the one that makes spring training really easy 
And to me, the work capacity phase is going to make what that first bullpen or first live BP for a pitcher coming back from an elbow injury will seem like a walk in the park because their bodies will never reach anywhere close to the cumulative stress that they reached uh, during our conditioning programs. Next is training density. I apologize for the generic slide. It's the best I could do. Um, but I look at the training density, meaning how, how like a sponge, how much are we gonna fill up each one of those boxes? And that's gonna start with how much each one of those boxes were filled up before we, we, you know, we became injured. And so training age or biological age, not just chronological age, becomes very important. I've dealt with a lot of 35 year olds that need to go back and do programs that 18 year olds should have been doing and vice versa. And so uh, we really try to break that down into phases. Brian Stoneberg, our uh, director of my league strength conditioning has done an unbelievable job of kind of phasing that stuff out and makes it very easy for myself or any coach that's going through this to kind of break this down. Again, we go back to the movement screen and look at movement dysfunction. If you can't hip hinge, I promise you, I'm not gonna give you a kettlebell swing until you can go down to your knees and show me competency and how you hinge. Uh, and so that movement screen becomes very important. Next is the baseball screen. Like again, uh, a 12 to 18 month rehab uh, is mental warfare. And if there's no light at the end of the tunnel of why we're doing things in the weight room or why we're doing things in the training room or why we're being so dogmatic about things, uh, it's really tough for the athletes to get through it. And so the baseball screen or, or understanding, you know, the baseball biomechanical and kinematic side of this is extremely important to talk to them about we're, we're doing this exercise to teach you how to load into your back hip. We're doing this exercise or we're getting you more ankle mobility right now to give you more freedom or we're teaching you how to do this exercise so you can block better against your front side without, you know, having a car wreck every time that you come down the hill. And so that one to me, anecdotally, and, and also more importantly, like mentally, is an extremely part of the density side of this. And, and we might spend months repatterning the way that somebody gets into their hips. Uh, number four is the weight and body fat goals. I think nutrition obviously plays a huge role in this. Um, as we've all been sitting around snacking for the last four and a half weeks now, uh, wondering when we're gonna get out of this. And, and nutrition is just so huge. But I've, I've been in baseball for, for 13 years, and I have yet to meet an athlete who's been at the right weight. Somebody's always uh, too heavy or too light, too fat or too skinny. And so this becomes very important, and this starts ultimately post-op uh, with meal plans, with supplementation plans for athletes that maybe need to uh, fix their guts, uh, their gut health, and, and then ultimately turn themselves in from an acidic sugar burner into an alkaline fat burner. And, and that's our goal with that. And, and our exercise then becomes a huge component of why we're doing that as well. And we always, during the density, will have general capacity built before specific capacity. And so uh, again, going back to the bullpen thing, we're gonna have uh, an athlete prepared for the reps, the sets, uh, the heart rate, and the stress that they're gonna face on the mound before the level that they reach. So if it's a bullpen, we're going to be two weeks ahead of that with, with our training. If it's a live BP, we're again going to be two weeks ahead of that and train that quality so they are not shocked when they, uh, or go to, into an alarm phase when they get out on the field. Um, workload management uh, is, such a, is such a huge topic. And uh, I, I think we've all went round and round with people about throwing programs and throwing distances. and. And, and different things that uh, we should or shouldn't be doing. And, and I just am at the point where every athlete is completely different and we can't ask them to do things that they have not prepared themselves to do. So uh, whether or not they're capable or not is a completely different discussion, but, but for workload management, I, I wanna know that I'm handing off an athlete who is capable of making mechanical changes. And so I think that that plays into I think that plays into workload because if you can't make a mechanical change, but a pitching coach is trying to get you to do one, that's going to cause a lot of stress to you. So can they get into into these new positions? Uh, and I, I I firmly believe that this will limit joint stress when when throwing if they can get into new positions and ultimately will raise their bar or their ceiling for uh, workload tolerance. Uh, moving more efficiently, both on and off the field is also very important. We don't ask people to go on a diet for one hour a day. Um, so I don't think that movement is just left in the training room, in the weight room or on the mound. How they sit in the dugout, how they sit on the plane, how they sit on the bus, how they sleep, 
uh, how they play video games comes into movement as well. And we need to be paying attention to that uh, because I think that's going to help aid in, in limiting cumulative stress, which again, if we can keep cumulative stress down or the tolerance down and never reach an alarm phase, I also think that raises our ability to have more workload tolerance uh, so that we can hopefully build a new workload profile. Um, I, I've gotten to the point too with, with our pitching coaches and our hitting coaches, when we talk about workload, like my goal every time is to make sure that uh, they know they can practice as much as they need to, to get better within reason, because we have built up a big enough bank account. If we get into June and somebody is in a slump or somebody uh, has command issues or needs to work on a new pitch and we can't do it because we're afraid of workload, I have not done my, done my job as a performance director to make sure that all the things that potentially uh, could limit stress or, or limit those issues uh, has been taken care of. So I take a lot of pride in that. And no matter what we do, it, it still needs to be progressive in nature. We need, we need to be able to, to be, uh, to show regressions as well, to pull back, not just saying that we are aggressive and always go, go, go. Uh, so everything needs to have progressive overload to it. And then be certain that the movement competency and capacity are no longer their limiting factors for success. Uh, training should be, you know, the support for their performance. It should not hold them back. Like when an athlete comes back from an injury or if they come back from the off season, whatever it might be, the last thing that I want to be in the way of them succeeding or uh, vying for a spot on our roster is something to do with their SNC. So we take a lot of pride in that and making sure that, that our guys are, are ready to go uh, when they come back from whatever it might be. And that is it. Um, Brandon, that was great. Um, I, you know, um, as I was listening to all that, um, it was pretty amazing. Uh, how far strength and conditioning has gone to major leagues uh, and movement patterns and everything else. You know, we, uh, we give talks all the time about the importance of kinetic chain um, and use that as a general term uh, of, of transferable weight from the, from the ground up. Um, but how you do that and how you train that and how you coach that is so critical. And I, you know, at the professional level, you've got uh, several strength coaches being able to work on them, be able to do this and to really coach them up. Uh, to make sure that they're there and that, that you really do get real hip hinge, you really get pelvic rotation, you get thoracic mobility, just to name a few, uh, and trying to put that all together. Where I'm seeing a lot of the problems um, uh, are at the younger ages who don't have the uh, ability and the time and the expertise around them to really learn movement patterns. When we see these people in the clinics um, at 16, it's, it's unbelievable. They can't, they can't move especially since they've done nothing but baseball uh, because of early specialization. They know how to throw, they know how to, how to swing, uh, but they don't know how to move their bodies. Uh, so I think that's, this is a great um, uh, detailed uh, discussion about this for, for everybody. Um, we're going to go into question and answers. Um, again, uh, the way we want to do this is um, uh, to just raise your hand so we can start uh, asking questions. Uh, I do. I uh, uh, had a had a, uh, email, a text message from uh, Brandon Erickson, uh, who's in the audience, uh, and I think he had some questions uh, uh, or some comments on Kevin's talk. So I'm going to open up, uh, Brandon. You you can talk right now if you. Uh, you got me, Stan. I think so. Yeah, go ahead. So no, I, I was just going to say on Kevin's talk, I, I, when he talked about the timing of return to sport, I, I totally agree with what he was saying about those two months being clinically significant. When we, when we looked at this, I think we were probably underpowered to determine if there was a true difference between when the guys who got back, or sorry, when guys got back that did not need a revision versus those that did. So I think the extra two months getting to that 17, 18th month mark uh, for the guys that did not need a revision to get back to the same level of play is probably clinically significant. So I totally agree with what Kevin said. Thank you, Great. Brandon. And um, just for everybody's sake, uh, uh, Brandon's going to be a uh, on uh, our future uh, uh, conference on weighted balls. So it's great to see him here. Hey, Stan, it's Jeff. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Go ahead, Jeff. Hey, Brandon, that was a great talk. I, I, I get to spend a lot of time with Kevin, and I, I really appreciate your, uh, your words. You know, Kevin says it all the time. If you can't cock the gun, it's tough to fire the bullet. And uh, I really appreciate the science you put behind that. That's good stuff. Uh, Chris Dotson, 
from Philadelphia. Hey, thanks. Thanks so much. My questions for Jeff, Jeff, great talk. Uh, quick question for you. I have done repairs like you mainly on younger uh, throwers. And I've actually had a couple of gymnasts who will have some of these partial tears and some of these young gymnasts, particularly some of the young, uh, girls, uh, particularly in the, uh, sublime tubercle side, I've been a little nervous getting both limbs of those tape in, uh, is a little hairy. The bone is kind of small. And in those cases, I've only put one limb in. I wonder your thoughts on that. Do you think that's a dramatic difference? Um, I just have felt that I was nervous about the, the, the size of the bone in some of these petite athletes and was nervous about – I just had a tough time getting both limbs in and the tape. Just want to get your thoughts. I know a technical question, but just curious. <clears throat> no, I think it's a very good question. I haven't, I haven't um, done that. I don't think there's anything wrong with, with doing one limb uh, rather than two. I think it's, it's such strong stuff. Um, plus, I think in the gymnast, you know, you've got uh, probably um, in the long haul a little less demand than a thrower. So, you know, I, I mean, we used to not fix these people at all and, and not fix elbow instability at all. So I, I'm sure that one limb would work just fine. I, I have not seen that issue. I haven't done one uh, where I've only put one, but I, I certainly don't think it changes the outcome. So I think it's a good call. If you get somebody to seat like that, that makes perfectly good sense. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. Um, I wanted to ask um, um, Jeff a question in regards to, you know, one of the things that scares uh, all the people who you do repairs on before the surgery is uh, the, uh, I think you make them sign something that says, if I get in there and your ligament looks terrible, I'm going to reconstruct. Um, what are you looking at specifically uh, to make that determination? And how many times, if you can give me an estimate on the percentage of times where you've gone in thinking you could do a repair and ended up not having to, uh, had to do a reconstruction? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm sorry I didn't address it in, in the talk. But, um, you know, I do think this is a game time decision. And we do prepare patients for both, unless they are absolutely unwilling to have one or the other. Um, you know, I think our preoperative assessment, if I, when I've looked back at that, we did a little kind of internal review of that, we were about a little over 90%, about 92% accurate in predicting what we were going to do if we, if we predicted we were going to be able to do the repair, we could do the repair, if we could predict we were going to reconstruct, we were reconstructing. Um, I think this speaks to the inability for MRI and clinical exam to be absolute, and, and MRIs can be a little deceiving speaks to the quality differences among MRIs and radiologists. And so I think that uh, it's been about 8% of the time when I thought I could do a repair that I've ended up doing a, a reconstruction. And, and I've always been thankful that I've had them consented for both because tissue quality, I think, will ultimately have a big thing to do, big part of whether or not these operations are successful. Yeah, to follow up on that even more, um, um, the, do you have any uh, issues, I guess, or, or concerns about um, uh, some surgeons who haven't done this procedure very much and kind of see the local high school guy uh, and try to do a repair? Um, what kind of advice would you give uh, to parents uh, when they say, well, um, uh, you know, here, uh, this guy says he can do it? Um, it's kind of a weird question, but, but you see where I'm going no, on that is that that, that, that decision-making process is, is a, a game time decision, really. It really is. I, I think people that are savvy at doing UCL surgery in general, don't have a problem with this operation. Technically it's, it's within the confines of what a UCL savvy surgeon can do pretty easily. And, and making that decision is, is fairly you know, easy for them to do as well. Um, if somebody is not accustomed to doing UCL surgery and not accustomed to the anatomy, where you put those tunnels is so important, especially the humeral tunnel. Um, whether you reconstruct it or repair it, it, it's just as important in both cases uh, for the success of these operations. So I, I don't think this is the kind of operation that somebody who only does, you know, one a year or hasn't done one should take on without taking some extra training or going to a, a course or something. But I think the UCL experienced surgeon uh, should have no problems with the repair. Uh, 
Uh, anybody asking? No, not many people asking questions, so I'm going to keep going. Um, how to ask Kevin, a question here on the on the side? Um, how do you balance pushing uh, but remaining conservative in, in your movement program? Uh, I'm again like with no previous injury history, kind of understanding a little bit of the AC joint type, um, and knowing if we can if we have a hook or if we're going to go overhead or not. Like I think that. Uh, Pushing is extremely important. I want good eccentric pec control to be able to uh, to be able to load the scap correctly. Um, and so I'm not a barbell bench press fan, but I, I do believe in I do believe in getting a, a good amount of bench pressing push up moves, uh, some uh, landmine pressing, and I'm a big fan of like unstable or unstable uh, bottoms up kettlebell presses or even bottom up bottoms up bench presses. Uh, who are you asking? Anybody? That was that was Hutt's question to me. I'm sorry. It was on the, it's on the side here. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I can just speak from what we do. Um, uh, we use a lot of closed kinetic chain activities um, uh, and uh, use. I do like concentric work. Uh, I mean, it pushes, but with a lot of eccentric work with the bed ball. Uh, we we focus on serratus anterior and lower trap. Uh, we think actually that the scapula may be a lot more. Uh, as much as we think it's important. Uh, I think it's probably more important than we think. We see a lot of uh, connections and, and activation from the serratus anterior to the lower extremity uh, in the glutes. So we do a lot of uh, close kinetic chain activity that, that works on just the scapula. Uh, we'll actually start our rehab on knee patient uh, starting with serratus anterior and, and try and get uh, uh, relaxation of the upper trap, which is a big problem, and trying to get the scapula in a good position. I think uh, when you really look at the entire kinetic chain, uh, there's, at any point you can um, lose energy, cause uh, movement disorders, and uh, end up uh, putting more stress on the shoulder and the elbow. Uh, but uh, all of those are important, but if I had to rank them, I would, I'd rank serratus anterior and the scapula as key to this whole thing. I think we see a lot of scapular dyskinesia uh, that takes a long time to fix. And uh, sometimes we improve it, but very rarely do we get all the way uh, to the end there. So we, we spend a lot of time with that. Um, and it's in a lot of push, but also to make sure that that scapula comes around the rib cage um, uh, in a, a normal manner, uh, which is hard to do. Um, that's what I got to say. Hey, Sam, I got a question for you, for, for you and Kevin and, and Brandon. You guys have all seen some of these patients postoperatively, and, and I know we did the, the study at ASMI, but have, have you guys recognized any differences between the post-op repair and post-op reconstructions in terms of mechanics or things they feel or, you know, stuff that you guys have kind of anecdotally seen in, in recovering patients? Kevin, do you want to take that? Uh, you know, I think it's, uh, as far as the difference between the two, I think um, it's easier rehab with the internal brace. I think there's a little bit more involved when you have a graph, obviously. Um, so I think it's easier rehab. I think it's easier to get motion. Um, I don't know if it's just the type of patient that's not as invasive or so forth, but I mean, I just think it's a faster pace. They have less pain as well. Um, not that UCL reconstructions are very painful. If anything, their graft so uh, site hurts more than any place else. But I just think it's, uh, you know, the, if anything, a lot of times, I, I think with the internal brace, I feel like I'm slowing people down because they feel too good too early. Um, so I'm a little apprehensive with it in that regard that, you know, they want to get moving like your alpha patient, you know, mm -hmm. that alpha patient, yeah. you know, I would have thrown a ball off his head that would have stopped <laughs> him from throwing. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think at some point you got to say, you know, better judgment, you got to slow it down just a little bit, you know, look at the big picture, but he was certainly rocking it to say the least, but I think a lot of them feel that way. Yeah, I would have had to throw a ball a couple hundred miles to throw it off his head, but um, <laughs> you know, I just uh, I agree with you. I, 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 what I see when they come back, um, people have different types of pain. You know, when people come back from UCL reconstruction, they have forearm discomfort, they have some pain in the flexor mass, um, they may have some ulnar nerve, you know, dysesthesias and things like that. Some of those things are the same. Some of them aren't. Um, you know. People come back and they complain of discomfort. Um, most of the time, it's the flexor mass. I, I've only seen one of the tapes re-tear. 
but that's just been my experience. So I don't know if other people are seeing those things and I'm not, which is certainly possible. But, um, you know, anytime we have a reconstruction or a repair and people come back and they hurt or they're not able to get back, they worry, did they re-rupture? Which we know the stats on that with reconstruction, but I don't know that we know a lot about it in the repair group. So, um, you know, we MRI them and, and it looks okay, but I, I, there's some things I think we still don't know about that. Hey, Stan. <clears throat> Yeah. Can I, can I ask a question? Maybe just throw it out to people. I'm interested in the interval throwing, you know, where we're at, because so many times the interval throwing, I think is, uh, I don't want to say neglected, but we just get on like an autopilot with it. Yeah. You know, so many feet, yeah. so many throws, so many feet, so many throws. Where are people at with taking a phase off or taking a period of time off? And I'd be curious to see where Brandon Stan is at. And also Jeff, you know, what's your mindset and, and open up to, the people on the call as well, how strongly they feel about the deloading and taking time off. I know some people take two weeks off, don't throw at all. Others just throw at shorter distances. What, what's your guys' view? Mine, uh, mine is absolutely uh, uh, to have time off, to, to, if you want to use the word deload. Um, we, uh, uh, over a 14 month period, you need not just a physical, uh, uh, downtime, but also mental downtime. Uh, in the professional ranks, it's pretty easy. You kind of move it around based on holidays and, and that kind of thing that they're going to be gone. At the college level, um, uh, it's a little bit more difficult because uh, they're gone for long periods of time and to keep their program down. But we always, uh, it was usually about seven to 10 days, sometimes two weeks, depending on where they were at, um, where we would, we would let them continue to condition but we wouldn't have them throw. We stopped them from throwing. Uh, and then what we did is if you, if you, if your first um, interval portion was a, let's say a hundred percent, when, when they came back after that, we would start their throwing pro program at 75% of where they ended and take it up 25% more before you took another uh, time off. And um, uh, I would, uh, I don't want to get yelled at later on today, uh, but that was a, a, a program that Nick Conti put in at the Dodgers years ago. Um, and uh, it first started out with just wanting to give people time off, but uh, it became more important to, uh, because of the workload. Brandon? Yeah, I think that number one, the, the deload for any activity, not just throwing, is, is extremely important. And it, to me, it's athlete to athlete, whether or not they're going to throw or not. Uh, if you have a max effort guy who just doesn't know how to necessarily throw at 70% RPE, like Telling him not to throw for a while is probably safer, whether it's seven days, 10 days, or two weeks, versus the guy who's been really controlled and, and you can just do something uh, easier to keep kind of the uh, kinematic stuff going. Uh, secondly, I think that with the interval throwing program too, that with as many modalities of throwing, whether it's weighted balls, Indian clubs, long toss, running guns, whatever it might be that are out there, uh, I look at the return to play throwing programs is not only getting them ready for the mound, but getting, getting them ready for whatever excessive throwing program they think they're going to be on. Uh, and so we try to build that in as well. In regards to workload, um, and, and Kevin and I have talked about this for a long time. Uh, in, in his presentation, he talked about using the motor sleeve, which I think is good. Uh, I think you have to monitor each thrower from an intensity standpoint. Um, and uh, I'm very vocal about the idea of perceived exertion. I think that's the wrong way to do it. Um, Kevin has showed, uh, Fleisig has showed, uh, and we have showed with Christopher Camp uh, that perceived exertion is not even close to what they're throwing. They're throwing a lot harder, um, and you're putting more stress on than you think you are uh, in order to monitor them. We use a radar gun uh, to teach them how to throw at 50 or 60 miles an hour and stay there. Um, I don't go a lot of distance in regards to the throwing program because I, for pitchers, uh, position players and, and um, uh, uh, catchers, uh, we, uh, we throw longer, but uh, I don't really go past 120 feet and actually many times on a pitcher won't go past 90 feet. I look at their intensity and their miles per hour and I, I guide them up that way. Uh, and if I want to create endurance in regards to them, I'll lower their the velocity, keep them down, and be able to throw more throws at that particular particular se uh, session. Um, and um, I think that if you're not monitoring their throwing uh, objectively, uh, whichever way you can do it, if you have Rapsodo, if you've got 
track man, if you got something else that you're using, it, it, it's fine. Uh, but I think you have to control the, the, the various torque. Uh, and, and you guys bring up a great point because our next week's session is on the uh, evidence-based uh, throwing programs and what they go into with Chris Camp and uh, Glenn Fleisick uh, uh, and uh, uh, Brian Stoneberg. is going to be talking about that and lay the foundation for our next one, which will be on the weighted ball uh, controversy and, and trying to get more educated on the good, bad, and the ugly of all that. Stan, um, how do you I'm monitor? Sure. Stan, how do you monitor mechanics when you mo when you're monitoring with a uh, gun to ensure that they're not changing their strategy? Yeah, I think it's a good point. And one of the people will say, like, "I can get them to throw 50 miles an hour, but their mechanics are off." Um, so, uh, uh, if you do have some kind of way to to actually monitor them from a biomechanical standpoint, that's great. Most people don't have that. I think it's still your eyes that look at that. You don't let them throw. Uh, um, uh, by pushing the ball or trying to baby the ball or anything at the beginning, you have to look at that mechanics and you start the education of the mechanics right from the first part of the throwing program. Uh, so uh, it's not as objective as you'd want it to put, to be put it in a lab uh, and have a look at whether they're changing um, uh, arm slot or anything like that. I think you have to visualize it. That's the reason uh, we throw with the player, don't just have them go out and throw. Um, and we just set up a, a radar gun on a, on a uh, tripod and really educate them on how to throw correctly, uh, but also be able to, to uh, handle their intensity of their throwing. So There's so many uh, video apps now, you know, like uh, Coach My Video and so forth that we can use just for some rough screening with throwing and even, even dial in the angles that they're throwing. I think that's important. I think it's maybe Brandon's point, if I can read into it, is you know, if they don't know where their body is in space and we don't give them feedback from a cognitive standpoint, they can't make those adjustments. So I love the radar gu uh, gun. I love that, but I, I just have to have a visual. Same thing with you know, jump training or anything else. If they can't see what they're doing, they can't correct it. No, that's a great point. Um, Nancy, uh, Tim, uh, Timothy. Yes, I just allowed him to talk. He can go ahead. Timothy, ask your question, please. Hey, uh, I have a question for, uh, for Jeff and also for Kevin. Uh, first, Jeff, I really applaud all the work that you've done. Excellent presentation. And I applaud your diligence in providing us with a, with a good option um, and plenty of follow-up on the work that you've done. We, we've been talking about this dichotomy between a repair and a reconstruction. But the next logical question that comes into my head is, should we be doing any internal bracing of our reconstructions? So I'd like to get your opinion on that. And if you have some experience on it, perhaps you could share that with us. Sure, uh, Tim, great, great, great question. I, I have not uh, done a lot of that. I've done a couple of those. Uh, George Paletta and John Conway have both done some of that. Um, where they've augmented their reconstructions with an internal brace. Um, done some, some folks have done that with revision, with revision reconstruction, augmenting it with an internal brace. Um, I think it's a very reasonable uh, thing to do. Uh, John Conway has some nice uh, information. I think both John and George have probably done more than I have. I've, I've done a couple of those. Um, in, in one revision, I, I didn't think that the bone quality in the ulna was very good. Um, and, and I put a graft in, this was in the early part of this, and I wasn't ready to uh, just re revise it with a repair. And um, I, I did a graft, and um, this was back in probably early 2014. And I did a graft, and I augmented it with the, with the internal brace and did fine. Um, I didn't include that in my revision numbers because it really was a reconstruction that I augmented. But I think it's a very, very good point, and I think people are expanding into that a little bit. Yeah, I know uh, Ken Akazuki and his group uh, did do a cadaver study on uh, the uh, internal brace with a, with a uh, uh, reconstruction and showed good results as far as some of the gap uh, testing that you did uh, previously. Um, my concern, I think, more than anything on using the internal brace from a rehab standpoint is um, whether or not that's going to give you um, the guts to, uh, to speed up the recovery. 
and start throwing earlier. Um, and uh, that worries me a little bit uh, in regards to, to we actually find um, some uh, long-term studies that show that, that you can do that. Uh, just having a brace uh, in there with the reconstruction might give you um, the courage to move quicker or the player, player may want to move quicker. What's your thoughts on that, Jeff? Well, you know, I, I think that just like any other end of bulging of a ligament, you know, every other ligament in the body that, that tears off the bone, we, we, we get those back on a fairly standard timeline. Uh, you know, the UCL would probably be no different in terms of its ability to heal back. So, so again, I think it's really more about the pathology. I think I'd be more inclined to be cautious about that in the in the partial injuries or the mid-substance injuries. And, and then you ask the question of whether or not the tape is a conduit for biology. Is that collagen dipping making a difference? And are we adding enough biology that it, that it can make a difference to get them back to get feel comfortable throwing them a little sooner? You know, we've been letting these people throw in, in week 11 um, when they've completed four weeks of plyos, which is definitely, you know, on the fast side. And I have to say that I was not, uh, that was a very nerve wracking thing for me in the beginning. And Kevin and I have talked about this a lot. Uh, you know, it, it took time for us to get to the point that we were, we were comfortable with that. I think the, the rehab protocol we have now I'm comfortable with people have said, well, maybe we can do it in five months instead of six to seven months. Okay. I, I personally am not going to, test that limit I, I feel good with where we are and uh you know I, I don't i don't see the need to push it much on that i guess i was asking more on uh, the reconstruction with an uh, internal brace whether you would oh. move, would attempt you to to move up that from let's say the typical 12 to 14 yeah. months and start growing earlier uh, because you think you have uh, protection if that's a good word yeah, I don't know that I would do that. I think that, uh, you know, you and I have talked about this before. I think most of the reconstructions that fail in the first year to two years are probably failures that occur in the first six to eight weeks, 10 weeks. And, and you know, they're not well-heeled grafts that are well-positioned and they're just unlucky and they tear again. I think that they probably never healed, revascularized, became a ligament <laughs> tissue those grafts didn't undergo enough ligamentization to support what the body was being asked to do. So I don't know that I would see the internal brace as a way to make that ligamentization of the graft happen faster. Um, I think it might in the long run provide some protection in the well healed graft, having that extra <laughs> tissue or extra tape in there, may be a nice backstop, but I don't know that I think it would speed up the biology Maybe the collagen dipping in the tunnels with the graft would have an effect on that, but I don't know. That's, I think that would be a marginal improvement on, on timeline, not much. Okay, uh, any other questions from the, from the group? Of, uh... we, we have one um, in the chat here. Uh, Omar Aguilar says, everyone has their guidelines and protocols, but how do you approach the adjustments on the fly? Or do you stay within your guidelines or protocol? Yeah, I'll jump in and, and I typed in an answer to Omar. I don't know if he got it, but uh, I'm always adjusting right. the protocol. Papa wants to FaceTime. Oh, I, I gotta go quickly. <laughs> What's that? Fix that, Nancy. <laughs> Got it. All right, go on, Kevin. Uh, so I'm always ad adjusting based on my assessment on a daily basis. I have my milestones, though, meaning range of motion, meaning strength, meaning where I want you to be at different time frames. And I think, you know, it's a delicate balance between hitting those milestones and if a person's in trouble. Uh, if a person's in trouble with motion, I think you have to hit the milestones. Um, if a person's having pain with throwing, then we got to make adjustments. We have to like, which Stan was talking about, we've got to break it down, look at intensity, what kind of mechanics do they have? Most of the time for me, when people are throwing and they have pain, they're overthrowing. It's almost always, they feel good. And they tell me I can't throw at a lower percentage as Stan's point. And I think, I, I think he's spot on. And that's where the radar gun comes in uh, very handy. I hate when people tell me I can't. I can't help it. I, I can only throw at 100 miles an hour. Give me a break. You can dial it down. You have to learn to dial it down. 
And it's like any tissue in your body is how I explain it to them is if you gradually increase the stress, the tissue will respond to that and it will end up even a stronger ligament. But if you overload it, it's going to potentially bust. And most athletes get, get that idea. For me with UCLs, it's very rare that they ever have pain during exercise. It's usually either a range of motion issue, which is really a low percentage. It's, it's probably about 1% at best. And then it would be a throwing program. But everything else in the middle, they never have a problem. I mean, plyometrics, everything else is not an issue. It's just really slowing down and controlling their throwing program. Great. Um, I think that's, uh, uh, we're going to stop there. We kind of went a little bit farther over, but uh, um, one thing nice about the, uh, the virtual uh, conference is you can get up and leave anytime you want. Nobody cares. Um, you go and Nobody go knows. to the bathroom and come back in. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, no, we track all that. The, uh, so anyway, we want to stop that. Um, in closing today, I want to uh, thank all the speakers and the for participation in making this happen. It's been great. Uh, we, we, you know, when you start these kind of things, you think, well, if we get 10 people, that'll be good. And almost all of us have given uh, talks where you, you're supposed to have 100 people and five people show up and you give a talk. So this is great. We got over over 400 people here. Uh, that that's great. Um, before you leave this session, we'd appreciate your comments on the on the poll that's out there. Um, it helps us with uh, future episodes. It's at the bottom uh, of your screen. Um, and uh, also, uh, when you leave, you'll get a, a, a monkey a survey monkey thing that needs to be filled out if you want CEUs. Uh, so just want to remind you of that. Um, so uh, it's our intention to provide this program weekly. We're going to do this weekly during the time of challenge for our, our country and the world. Um, we, uh, we know uh, you join us uh, in our appreciation of first responders. We respect and honor these uh, heroes as they risk their lives to save ours. Each week, a, a new invitation will be sent out um, from pre uh, for all the uh, for all the attendees. We're pleased to have attendance of over 400 today, as I said, and we receive a, a, you'll receive a new invitation on Friday. Please respond right away. Uh, we do only have 500 uh, uh, seat capacity. Um, and next week's panel, let me uh, go a uh, evidence-based uh, interval throwing programs. It's really been about the science of, of throwing uh, with Christopher Camp from the Minnesota Twins. Uh, Glenn Fleisick on his biomechanics from ASMI and Brian Stober from the Dodgers. Um, what we're hoping to do is create a, a foundation here uh, so that on the following week we get into weighted balls uh, and we'll probably do a round table there. We'll give you more information on that. Um, and uh, uh, that'll be a good, a really good uh, presentation this week, next week and the week after. Uh, any, anybody who wants to give me suggestions in regards to topics, uh, this is really for you guys. Uh, not for not for me, um, and uh, we've got a lot of speakers who want to talk who have uh, great experiences. Thank you very much, uh, and we're done. Thank you. <laughs>